The following is a live broadcast of a Lone Star Community Radio program. Recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Connors FM 104.5, 106.1, and Facebook.com slash IRLoneStar. For more information on this show, please visit our show page at IRLoneStar.com slash shows. To sponsor or donate to this program, visit our donate page at IRLoneStar.com slash donate, or email us at lscrstudios at gmail.com, or give us a call at 936-666-1084. Lone Star Community Radio production and broadcast is possible by folks like you. So sponsor and donate today. Hi, this is Buck Yeager, and you're listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZWLP Conroe and 106.1 KZCCLP Conroe and worldwide on IRLoneStar.com. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Extension Hour. I'm Amy Ressler, County Extension Agent for Family and Community Health, and I've got some awesome guests with me today. I'm just so excited to have you guys here. So, you know, in the Extension Hour, we talk about our people, our programs, and our partnerships, and one of the things we've been working with is Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force, and we were on a... Um, a Zoom meeting recently, I mean, because you know, we're not meeting in person right now, being careful, but we um, were on a Zoom meeting and uh, Gail and Dr. Maria were talking about some of the work that they're doing with their work group. And so um, they came on the show today to talk about that. But we're also going to talk a little bit about them and what they do um, outside of the Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force. Although I'm guessing that those are probably pretty closely related for you guys too. So um, they're not really separate things. But, so I'm, I'm rambling just to start out with but let's go ahead and get started gail you want to introduce yourself oh hi uh delighted to be here today amy uh, i feel really privileged to be part of your little uh hour time here together uh, so my name is gail fisher um, i'm the parent of two and they have drugged me th into lots of areas that i probably would not have ventured into uh, but here i am and i'm hu constantly humbled and uh, so working a lot in the mental health awareness and uh, learning differences as a parent with that kind of skin in the game. Right, right. And then uh, Dr. Maria Cantera Conk. Good. Good. You, okay. you got that right. But, but often it's just Dr. Maria, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, but that last name, Dr. Maria, is, is it. <laughs> That's the way we go. So I am a licensed psychologist. And um, unlike a lot of my colleagues, I actually chose a number of decades ago to work with uh, kids and adults that have different developmental conditions. So my specialty has been autism, uh, intellectual disability, uh, and also the co-occurring mental illness with those individuals. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time and I absolutely love the work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work at Tri-County Behavioral Health Care and what I do is to do the assessments for people that may have those conditions and are looking for services, uh, services and supports. So I've known Gail for a long time. I don't even know how many years now. And, uh, and then our paths keep crossing. This time they crossed in the Behavioral Health Suicide Prevention program and we had this opportunity to work together how could I pass it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the behavioral health and suicide prevention task force like I said has um, 13 different work groups and one of those work groups is neurodiversity and you kind of alluded to it just a little bit but let's talk about neurodiversity what is that and why do we use that term so from a uh, I'll let Dr. Maria do the clinical version, but as an educator and having worked in industry in the past and then as, as a parent, um, in the old days we had some really dark words for it um, and then eventually kind of special needs and then, then another brighter word, learning differences. And then now this, this best word, neurodiversity, and we've, we've worked to get it into, embedded into the thread of all that we're doing at BHSP. Mm -hmm is it, it, it doesn't distract. So if I said IDD, it basically kind of sucks the joy out of the situation because there's not much hope for your kid, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's the opposite of that because we know that if the brain is, the neural pathways are plastic and we can grow and we can move them forward, then there's still lots of hope for our kids. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons I'm a big cheerleader for neurodiversity is that it doesn't exclude anybody and it doesn't make you wish you weren't here. <laughs> it doesn't make you wish you were dead. Yeah. So um, it's it, with lots of hope. So if you are wired differently, m uh, if it's a mental health issue, if you're off your meds, if you have cerebral palsy, maybe that's not a, m um, a mental neural pathway difference, but you could present like someone that might be mm -hmm. 
um, you know, with, with a different mindset. So sometimes it's physical. You can tell by an appearance. Sometimes you cannot tell by an appearance. Are you wired slightly differently? How do you learn? How do you process information? When the data comes at you, how do you react? If it's delayed or different, then how do we, and why we're in this, this uh, world together is just to help everybody understand how the other person's processing. Okay. And just to back up a little bit, you said IDD. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an acronym for? Intellectual Disability Disorder. Intellectual, okay. yeah, and Developmental Disability. So we've got yes. the clinical side of it, right? So the so IDD, a, Neurodiversity. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about that, Dr. Maria. Yeah, I, and, and I think it, you, Gail said it so well. When we talk about neurodiversity, we're looking at the fact that people see the world differently and process it differently. Now, folks like me, you know, the licensed personnel, the clinicians, we diagnose we identify and, and, and label the condition that the person has, and that's important. We need to know what kind of condition the person has because there are times when there are specific treatments that are appropriate, um, and if you have autism, you need to know that you have autism. Mm -hmm. that, that communicates something, but what it doesn't communicate is that that individual is not gonna get cured from it, and interacts with the world in a unique way. The world needs to know that because it's not that person's problem that they have autism. Mm -hmm. It's an interaction between that person and the rest of the world. The rest of the world needs to modify a bit and understand how that individual might be processing differently. For example, a, a lady with autism told me many years ago that she saw the world like pictures uh, in a video. And I think about it, and I, yeah, I kind of do, but I, I listen to words. Well, in her, her mind, words were not meaningful. If she could see a picture or a video of something, she was never going to forget it. Wow. That's very different than the way I process, but it helped me so much to understand her diversity in how she approaches the world. We were able to communicate much better. So I think the concept of neurodiversity is so broad, and as Gail said, it's a positive way of seeing people as opposed to seeing them only in the context of the condition that I might diagnose. So both of you work in the area of neurodiversity and with neurodiverse audiences, neurodiverse people. Um, you mentioned Tri County, so let's yes. talk a little bit about Tri County and the services. Well, Tri County Behavioral Health Care is one of 39 centers around the state of Texas. Uh, all of these centers are geographically distributed and each one serves a number of counties. There's a couple that serve just one county, like Harris, it's so big. One, right. centers, <laughs> one center's almost not enough. But in our particular area, just north of Harris County, we serve Montgomery, Walker, and Liberty counties. Uh, when I say we serve, people who are looking for services for people with intellectual disabilities uh, or autism, people who uh, have behavioral health problems, mental health issues, can go to this center, get evaluated to see if there are benefits that they can receive. They may be federal benefits, they may be state benefits, we have a lot of grants, different programs that, that we offer, mm -hmm. uh, and a person may be able to get some supports that way. At minimum, there are service coordination services that an individual can get to kind of navigate the system. You know, there are things out there in Texas, but how do you get them? Right. And a, a good coordinator can help you, mm -hmm. as well as therapies and other programs. And, you, and you're unique for these three counties. So if you happen to live in the three counties for which Tri-County is licensed for yes. or grandfathered in, then they would be your only gateway to liaisoning with the state of Texas. That's right. Okay, so um, if someone was listening and is not in the three county area that um, you just mentioned, so wh what other types of things, how do, how do people in other parts of the state look for similar services? They can either Google or call mm -hmm. Health and Human Services, okay. HHS, in the state, and by county, they will tell you which center serves your area. Okay. Every county in Texas is served by some, what is called an authority, that's, that's the, the name that the state right. gives us, either a mental health authority or a 
Local Intellectual Developmental Disability Authority, which has the horrible acronym LIDA, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have to have acronyms. And, and <laughs> you can find it in Google, too, because I've helped people find by their which county they're in. Mm-hmm. So if you Google L for local, IDD for those words that we don't want to say out loud, he who has no name, um, and then authority, so local LIDA. And then they have a very special relationship with any citizen in any of those counties. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, Tri County has a special thing that transcends into Harris County outside of your three, and that's helping some of the families with ABA that's resources. Right. We have um, and this is kind of neat. HHSC granted us uh, money to serve mm-hmm. children with autism ages three to sixteen through applied behavior analysis. Uh, you know, we're very fortunate in this area. We have a lot of private therapists that work with applied behavior analysis but it's not an inexpensive service. Mm. Um, It's a very expensive service, and a lot of families can't afford it. Um, Even good, hard-working families, we're we're talking a lot of zeros that uh, have to be paid. Four or five when I was paying it. Yes, ma'am. Four or five thousand a month. Uh, But at at Tri-County, we have these services that are actually subsidized by state grant. So it, between, again, ages 3 to 16 children that have a recognized diagnosis of autism, we do, I do, also assess kids for autism. So if a child is suspected of that, they can call Tri-County, say, I think my, well, the parent can call Tri-County and say, I think my child has autism. Mm-hmm. We can do an assessment. If we identify them, then they can have access mm-hmm. to those services uh, and that's pretty neat. The, that ABA is a, uh, an evidence-based practice for folks with autism that really shows um, some progress. Uh, and when we talk about autism or any kind of neurodiverse um, condition, it's, um, it's more of a, it's a spectrum, right? So it's not just like black or white, this or that. There's, there's a lot of variations in those. There's, of course, the classic rain man, right? But that's a long, right. long time ago. They say if you've met one person with autism, mm-hmm. you've met one person with autism. So it, I, I always, if someone says they're an expert, I wonder, but if you say you're a specialist, I'll buy that. Okay. It's just so much variation. And another thing that Tri-County does that we sure want to make uh, aware of to your families, the waiver lists that you want to sign up for and get it um, for your children, and it, they are um, redocked every year, right? Yes, to, to confirm, yes, you still want to keep your child on the waiver list. So if you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about for the waiver list, then ping one of us, and you do want to get your child signed up. Hopefully you never need those resources when they get to the top of the list, but it's a long list, and, um, they are des- and the, the resources are designed to help your children with independence when you're not here. So. Yeah, this is really, and I'm so glad that you brought that up. Uh, a lot of families think, well, you know, I'll wait because the public schools do a good job. They, they provide education and so on. I'll wait till my son or daughter is ready to graduate, and then I'll check out and see mm-hmm. what my center can offer me. And I'm saying no. When your child is tiny, get on those lists. When Gail says that it's a long wait. Um, 10,000 at least. Mm -hmm. 13 to 14 years a person can be on the interest list and be waiting for those services. Uh, The services are a comprehensive array. Um, It's like a, it's a benefit. It's it's a Medicaid benefit. And even if a person doesn't have Medicaid, they need to get on the list because by the time that that son or daughter is 18 years old, they might be looking at Medicaid. They may not be able to hold a full-time job or get, get medical coverage. Mm-hmm. And so if they've been waiting on the list all that time, you want your name to come up on the list to be able to then access some services. It, it really it just takes a couple of minutes to get the name on the list. And as Gail said, then about once a year, get a phone call from us saying, are you still interested? Please say yes. <laughs> and uh, and, and that could be a lot of benefit for, for the future. So. Right, because there's a lot of things that can be done along the way to help um, adapt. So either the neurodiverse person or those that care for them and interact with them, there's a lot of things that um, can be done along the way to make it a little easier. And, and is we, that kind of what you do in your work? Yes, yes. Okay. In, in fact, it's a special concept called early 
early intervention. Early mm -hmm. isn't yesterday with lamentations and shoulda, coulda, woulda. And it surely isn't tomorrow with delays and procrastination. It's today. So with your child's learning, with your interventions, no matter what happens today is the most important day of your child's learning. And those neural pathways are important and we do all we can to help them with redirects and the immune system comes into play here. Mm -hmm. So I've had to pay a lot of attention to methylation with, with my kiddos. I've got one child that's an awesome um, a young person, uh, I'm an ally, so those of you know what that means um, of gender issues, who's uh, with mental health awareness and is on medication. My younger boy is not, but we're doing everything on a very rigorous daily basis with nutrition and, um, and neurotransmitters to um, help him with his clarity, focus, school, which I'm sure we'll talk about school supports here, you know. Okay. Um, so. Yes, absolutely, and early, uh, so parents don't put it off. Um, remember that today, and, and don't, don't have guilt about yesterday, and right. don't have fear about tomorrow. Just do it today, and have joy and peace. So tell us a little bit about getting sorted. What is that? So um, when, uh, <laughs> when my kids started getting diagnoses, I mean official diagnoses, it was like it really changed what I did with my adult life. So all of it, I was in education at the time, a past experience in um, uh, industry, petrochemical mm -hmm. construction. And then uh, midlife crisis, so I'm working with kids, uh, just a general educator, fourth through eighth grade generalist, alternate certification. And then, lo and behold, my kid gets a diagnosis, almost dies from an anaphylactic reaction of fire ants, it opens up ASD, what are you talking about? And before you know it, I'm up to my nostrils in learning differences, and what do we do about that? So, um, the... Um, uh, as to, so I became an adjunct. I finished my master's in educational technology. I switched to a specific, you know, focus on the neurodiversity. Back then, we just called it learning differences. And then uh, when I graduated, someone said, hey, why don't you do this? And then, and then somebody else said, hey, go over here and be an adjunct, which I am at Lone Star. And then we started a group for the siblings. And someone said, hey, why don't you make that a nonprofit? And so it's just kind of grown. It's evolved just as somebody has needed something in this world that, that and the resources aren't there. So there's there's a bazillion people doing wonderful mm -hmm. things, you know, Dr. Maria's team and many other teams, but there's gaps. So getting sorted has just been my version of trying to help in the, uh, and document everything that I've learned because of my kids and, and then making sure that it's there so for the coming families, for the kids who, you know, aren't even born yet or, or the, or the uh, to help prioritize, because when you first get, and you parents that are listening, you know how this feeling is. You, you know something's wrong, your kid's not keeping up with peers, and then all of a sudden, somebody says these words that just bring you to your knees, and, and you start to wonder what are you gonna do? Well, if you have to start from, from ground zero on, on prioritizing your interventions, that's a tremendous amount of churning and learning, and there's not enough time in the day to do all the things that you've gotta do for your other kids, and your job, and your spouse, and the world in general. So, what I've tried to do, Amy, is just, um, and this is why I'm so humbled, is to, um, to document everything that I've learned from the fantastic experts that have been in it before me. Mm -hmm. And so we always sit on the shoulders of giants, right? And um, from, a, from a methylation, immune system, through learning, through behavior, through everything else that you can think of. So if you have a child that's not keeping up with peers, all of a sudden your life is gonna to have to be, everything is gonna take longer, it's gonna be more complicated, there's nothing that's automatic anymore. But you gotta get your own head out of that worry and fear and it can't be about you and you're now trying to focus on the child and where do you go for those resources? At the same time there is self-care and at the same time there is behavioral health and um, so it, it just really complicates things. So if any of us can help leave a trail of breadcrumbs, the wider the better, the denser the better, and help each other, then aren't we supposed to? And we have the tools these days, right? Look at the studio, look at everything that A&M's doing to help, and everything that Tri-County and the websites that we're trying to build in the databases. We didn't have that 10, 20, 30 years ago. For those generations, they just, I mean, I have cousins that just stayed in the basement their whole life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's no way to live. So we're not stuck with our kids like that these days, so mm -hmm. anyway. 
So, and I can t- you're, you're very, very passionate about what you talk about, and that's one of the things I appreciate most about you, Gail. So um, the Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force is very fortunate to have both of you on that. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take just a little bit of a break. Um, we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about what the neurodiversity work group is doing. And you guys have developed a really great visual for helping um, communicate, um, particularly in crisis when we're um, perhaps to the point of contemplating suicide. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back. But I am Amy Ressler and I've got Gail uh, Fisher and I've got Dr. Maria Kendera Conk with us. And we are talking all about um, neurodiversity and the Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force here on the Extension Hour. And we'll be back right after this. What can the Better Living for Texans program do for you? You can learn how to increase your consumption of fruits and vegetables, choose foods that are relatively inexpensive and good to eat, make your food dollars last longer, prepare quick, nutritious meals, help your children learn how to eat healthier snacks, and much more. Our program is committed to helping people like you improve your health through providing research-based nutrition education in a friendly, cost-free, and relaxed environment. We are Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, helping Texans make their lives better. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question or comment about one of our shows? Just contact the station on IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936-647-3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. Don't forget to download the Lone Star Community Radio app from your Google Play or Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM. That's Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. If you are on the computer, bookmark IRLoneStar.com as your internet radio station. A Lone Star Community Radio. Broadcasting 24-7 from the heart of downtown Conroe, Texas. Welcome back to the Extension Hour. We're here with uh, Gail Fisher and Dr. Maria, and we're talking about neurodiversity. And um, like before we went to the break, we had a great conversation about um, the things that, um, the the reason why you guys work in this area um, and some of the things that Tri-County does, some of the things that Getting Sorted does. Um, We talked about neurodiversity, what that means. It's just, it's it's a... would you a, a, a nicer term, a more descriptive term about Positive. the differences that that people experience? Um, so one of the things that you guys have been doing is working on one of the work groups of the Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force, and that is the Neurodiversity Group. And I know that you you're also involved in some other groups too. And we can we can talk about those if we have time. But I really want to focus on what you guys are doing um, in terms of. I'm helping those with neurodiversity and suicide prevention and behavioral health. So there's there's two different parts of that, right? So behavioral mm-hmm. health and me- sometimes we say mental health, but behavioral health, um, there are some similarities. It's mostly just semantics in terms of uh, the, those uh, words, but mental health, behavioral health, and then suicide prevention. And can that be extra challenging for someone who's neurodiverse or how you, you handle those differently, right? We do. We do in in many ways. Mm -hmm. The reason why this particular group obviously draws our attention because of our background, but also because it's so under-recognized. In fact, folks in general don't recognize that people who have perhaps more limited intellectual ability, um, who, who do view the world differently or have these developmental diagnoses, they can also become so depressed, so hopeless, that they want to end their lives. But what happens, which is particularly distressing, is that they'll say, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. And the response will be, oh, don't worry about it. You don't need to worry about that. And of course, since they're supervised, they're not going to hurt themselves because there's always somebody watching them. But just think. Think about how awful it is to be living with that sense of 
I'm worthless, nobody cares about me, to be living in a world where there aren't as many friends because we're talking about a population of people that aren't really socially adept, uh, they're more isolated, so by definition they're more separate from their community and now they're feeling dis disp despair. Uh, I often talk about the presentations on, on suicide in this particular population and point out that psychological pain isn't defined by your IQ level. Pain is pain. Mm -hmm. And so we, we got together and said, you know, this particular subgroup, uh, hats off, by the way, uh, to Judge Mack for including this group because many efforts wouldn't even think of it. It wouldn't be on the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, including this group and being able to lead it, thinking about the first thing is raising awareness, getting people to recognize that, yeah, folks really do try to commit suicide and can succeed. They may not be able to get a gun, which is the most common way, for example, for men to commit suicide, especially in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. May not be able to get a gun and shoot themselves, but you see them running out into traffic intentionally or getting hit by a train, or hanging themselves. And they may not be very sophisticated in how they do it, but the message is clear. Mm -hmm. They're in pain, we need to listen, we need to do something. So uh, one of our previous shows, we had Kami Hazim from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and she was talking about um, some of the warning signs and ways to talk with people who might be considering suicide. And um, she mentioned how some of the sometimes it's um, what we may think is counterintuitive, right? So we may think, oh, you know, don't worry, things are not so bad. Just look on the bright side. And when someone is in the situation where they are contemplating suicide, that might not, that's probably not the best way. So even actually directly talking and saying, are you thinking about it? Do you have a plan? So you guys um, came up with a, a graphic to help people when they're talking to people with um, neurodiverse um, situations. So uh, Dick, can you bring up the, uh, the graphic for us. So we're looking at um, a graphic that was developed by the Neurodiversity Group. And so you guys, um, so this is a, a draft version. It's also been um, updated a little bit. We're kind of testing it out, seeing how it's accepted and um, seeing if there's anything that needs to be tweaked. But, um, you know, you guys came up with a really great, great tool here. So let's talk about that a little bit. It's a guide for the first time listener. Um, so Neurodiversity Special Needs is a work group of the Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force. There's nine different um, boxes there. So tell us about that first box. What is that in there? Well, as you said, the whole idea is to give the listener some guidance. Uh, we think about the person who's in pain, we need to do something, but it is awkward and it is a little uncomfortable for us to hear somebody say, I want to kill myself. Mm -hmm. Our reaction is often to go, no, 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 no. It's okay, and to run. Well, mm -hmm. that of course tells a person your message isn't that important. Yeah. So right out of the gate, we're saying, yes, the first thing to think about is to ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? It's okay to use the word. It does not cause people to go out and do it. It mm -hmm. doesn't give them permission. On the contrary, it validates them and starts to create a safe place. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've got here is, is trying to give the listener some pointers about things that you might say. You don't necessarily have to go lockstep through it, mm -hmm. but these are some things that, that you might actually use as guides for the person, uh, for, for what you might say to a person. Um, and Gail? in fact, from a, just a parent standpoint, my older one, we had these words. I remember my child um, in the trying on clothes in the closet upstairs. This was after the turmoil of John had kind of subsided and I kind of had a groove on for what to do for a young kid in the spectrum. And then my older child, who I had really kind of thought was going to be just no no trouble right but all of a sudden something had happened and there were the words I just want to kill myself so to all the parents that are out there and all you potential first-time listeners and real first-time listeners when you hear that you definitely want to ask do you have a plan and that's why we wanted to put this here is that that's if they do have a plan then <laughs> 
particularly pay attention, please. Mm -hmm. um, if, they, if they don't, then if they're just attention seeking, there is no just about that. It's, it's time to do something. But if, they, if you asked, do you have a plan? And they said yes, then definitely you need to you know, ramp up and get, get, mm -hmm. get extra attention. So as Dr. Maria was saying, and Amy, thank you for bringing this in, um, we've had about three or four teams of some international, some young people, some officers, some cops, uh, retired cops, some moms, some educators, a little bit of a, a beautiful, in, in the fancy pants world of education, we call it um, a pilot testing, and we do rapid reiteration and all those buzzwords, just to say that we followed best practices with this to get a lot of input from people people that would be a tool and we have the second page which has no text so just imagine the second page flip side head-to-head double-sided page and we're imagining kind of like a laminate quality so any kind of a first responder or a first listener they could three hole punch it if they wanted or it could be on your device and you just have it to show um, and then the, the back side just doesn't have the text so it's 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 not like a leading question and it might be better for someone with a higher or a lower and I hate to say that yeah. mode, um, depending on their expressive language and their auditory processing and their receptive language and all of that, um, all those clinical words. Um, but uh, just give you something to start talking about, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. And to listen. Right. And then the, the next one there, your feelings matter. Uh, and asking what are you feeling right now, that's kind of what yeah. you were talking about earlier, helping to validate. Um, there's a, the next box is uh, what are you thinking about now? What's the the purpose of asking? <laughs> I, I checked with. Um, forgive me for it's it's the rubber bands. Okay, so <laughs> as we were looking at images and trying to think about. Okay, so we're trying to be not gloom and doom. But we're trying to just you know give some lighthearted approach to it, but at the same time. So are, are you is your thinking rubber bandy? Or are you kind of like is it in a just trying to be humorous, right? And so anyway, we came up with an image that had the rubber bands and it passed every one of the testings. Every time I asked, hey, do you guys like this picture? Does it look dumb? They said, no, no, keep the rubber bands. So anyway, it's, um, uh, and then going on to the next one would be the, the power, right? Yes. Of, of listening. Of listening, that everybody's got a story. And even a person who doesn't have a lot of language, even if they just say, I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm mad, over and over again, that's okay. Mm -hmm. We got to hear them say, I'm mad. And then start moving them to, it's important to me. You value, I'm val uh, you're valuable to me. It's important to me that you're mad. Tell me a little bit more. Yeah. And if they lack the language, the words, the expressive yeah. language, then right, we're going for body language. That's right. That's Act right. it out, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of those things, too, that um, once you say, I'm listening, tell me your story, you need to just shut up and listen, you right? Do. Right. <laughs> because it, this, makes pe this makes us nervous, right? We've been in, and it's this sense of urgency that we need to do something about it. And so um, lots of times it'll make people that are listening feel like they need to talk instead of listen because they need to talk you out of it. So just... To shut your mouth and listen when it's time and, to And you listen. see some, and we've even edited this to, an, as you say, to a further degree. So um, uh, find a quiet place to, to talk, but really it's zip it, right? Yeah. So yeah. we zip our mouths and we don't need to feel panic. They'll feel, feel that mirrored and that is mm -hmm. almost diminishing, right? We don't want them to feel diminished in any way. Right. We're all ears. Mm -hmm. Tell us. In the next iteration, we, um, we'll, we have included the telephone numbers for the National Suicide Hotline, right. and then for the crisis line at Tri-County for our area, mm -hmm. so that the listener doesn't just sit there going, well, now what? Yeah. So there are yeah. actually some numbers to reach out and get some help. And the help, the most valuable help may be that, Gail, I'm going to sit here with you. Let's call together. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the person is not just, well, here's the phone number, call, and right. and that's that. No, that that's very frightening. That's very threatening. And the person may not even be able to express themselves well enough to be able to speak to the folks in the crisis line. But I, as the listener who's there supporting, I can help facilitate that. We found a text number two. So it's that's listed right. on the, the, the one that we call final, but who knows, I mean, it may, it may, it may uh, have some iterations as time goes by. Mm -hmm. And then also a number for veterans too. Okay. You know, one of the things too that, that this brings up, this is a one-to-one, -one, the person who's talking, mm -hmm. person who's listening, but we need to increase awareness in our whole community about suicide. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tri-County does have a mental health 
um, a um, mental health first aid program, which is free of cost, and it's an eight-hour training mm -hmm. that can be provided to any group. I mean, a church gets together and the ladies group wants to sponsor this, uh, Tri-County can send out staff to do this mental health first aid, which includes this component of suicide awareness and what do you do mm -hmm. and what are the resources. Uh, it's gone to schools, it's gone to first responders, I, you name it, any group that wants it. Amy, you want to pull together a bunch of people? Tri-County will be there <laughs> yeah. to, to help educate and um, increase awareness because it could be any of us. It could be any of our family members. Right. Well, you don't expect it. You right. Know? And at Mental Health First Aid, we also have several county extension agents that are trained to do that. And in fact, in yes. our office, too, our program assistant is trained um, to do the mental health first aid. So it, that's often done in, in teams, too. So Perfect. there's more than mm -hmm. one person um, it, leading that so that there is another person who is available to be attentive and watching for potential um, signs that someone might need a little bit more mm -hmm. attention as that goes along. Um, but yeah, throughout the state, there's, uh, you know, obviously Tri-County yes. and then um, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service also has a lot of mental health first aid um, trainers as well. Um, and what you mentioned too about listening, it kind of goes along with that next square too, I think, where it says you're valuable to me um, and what makes you feel valuable. So just listening and not just here's a phone number, mm -hmm. good luck. Well, well, it, it, uh, oh, it ties a little bit into like the pressures of the education too, which is a, a separate subject. But back to the picture here is, um, it's uh, it's how they uh, it's how they f reward themselves, right? So if we say to kids, it's const it's the new best practices. You don't want to brag on the kids. Oh, that was really great. Look what you did. It's more of character building. That you must feel very proud of yourself mm. that you've been able to put that much effort into something, right? Mm -hmm. So we were trying to capture a little bit of this, which goes back to the self-esteem issues. The not that you're you're a valuable person because I approve of you, but rather right. you're a valuable person because of who you are to you. Right. And then the next one says, "I'll help you get help." What do you think would help you? Tell talk to us about that a little bit. And that's where we have those, as I said in the next iteration, the numbers oh, okay. for folks to be able to reach out. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you could get answers such as, I like music. Okay, well, let's listen to some music. And I'll you know, pull up something on YouTube on the phone mm -hmm. that the person can listen to that will make them feel a little bit better at that moment in time. Will it resolve the issue altogether? No, but if you can get the person in a calmer place, that's a better position from which then to, to start moving them into some resources. Right. Um, and these last two that are on here, a little bit about um, if you don't have the, the words to use or maybe the pain or the... Um, that whatever the person is experiencing doesn't come out. We, we can't always, mm -hmm. e even um, any kind of, any any person sometimes can't really explain, this is how I'm feeling now. So um, can you share your pain with me? Maybe it's headaches, maybe it's um, cramps, maybe it's um, sensory overload, those kinds of things. And then the, the lineup of matches with um, one, a new match and the other one kind of burned out. Those are those are great visual um, graphics to kind of explain how people might explain how they're feeling. It also and, reminders to us because, again, talking about a population that may not be very verbal, mm -hmm. may not be able to express themselves. Just think, if you had a really bad toothache, and you had no way of communicating it, and it's there day after day, week after week. Mm -hmm. You can't eat very well, and everybody's telling you you need to eat, but you can't eat very well. How do you communicate that? At some point, it's going to get pretty desperate, right. and people start hitting themselves and really inflicting some damage because they had a pain. So it's also a reminder to us that sometimes people's terrible behavior that somebody else described is really a cry for help because there's something going on with them physically mm -hmm. and we need to consider that possibility if they're hitting their stomach all the time maybe their stomach hurts and maybe they have indigestion or they're scratching themselves mm -hmm. bloody I don't know about you but we live in southeast Texas and I've got all kinds of little allergies that keep me scratching but right. I can find lotion 
what can they do? So mm-hmm. it, it's also part educational for the person mm-hmm. who's listening to mm-hmm. broaden their perspective about what could be happening. Right. And so if we see those behaviors, what's the need behind the behavior, right? And if they don't have the words, and, and or they feel like they've never been heard. So let's say they try to do some kind of automatopoeia mm-hmm. expression of some kind of a pain, but if they feel like nobody's listening, then they'll just become more intense, right? right. Of trying to get uh, their need met. Mm-hmm. So these are great, um, list, uh, a guide for a first listener, really for anyone, but this is, uh, you guys work specifically in neurodiversity. So just kind of go over a couple of different things of how you would handle um, a neurodiverse situation differently than a, a, another situation. Well, I can certainly, um, like for the younger ones, and you may go ahead, go ahead and, and respond for the olders. So um, for school-age kids, you know, K through 12, um, Let's say that uh, my my child is, and, and John doesn't really have these issues. His is more, you know, different kind of bail, pile of worms with my with my son John. But let's say that he is behaving in a certain way to get out the door to go to school. All right. Mm-hmm. What he's really trying to say, but we don't have the sentences, is that he really wants to have independence, and he's a rising teenager, so he really would like mom out of the way. But it comes across as just being a little stinker. Right in his behavior, so mm-hmm. it's it take it goes back to that listening instead of trying to talk. If we could step back and look at what's going on and use all of our senses, all of our intelligences and experiences to realize, okay, this person is trying to ex- tell me something. Mm-hmm. I need to be a better detective. Yeah, and it, it, what's curious is that at the point where someone says or acts that they want to hurt themselves, they want to kill themselves it starts merging with what we would do with anyone else. It then becomes a stop and listen. Now with that listening, it may mean that we're gonna go for a walk and and stay active. It may mean that we're sitting coloring while the person is grunting and, and tearing a piece of paper, but they get another one, let's color some more. Without telling them this is what you have to do, you gotta finish this assignment, that's not the point but following their lead and recognizing through this, we hope, that you can be comfortable in following their lead. It's time to listen, and the listening may not be just the talking that we're so used to, but going with the person and and exploring with them how they feel and then helping them get help. They will need more assistance Mm -hmm. than most folks would because they just don't have the tools to activate. And if they're drowning in words anyway, right, they don't want a bunch of words from us. Right. So they want our ears, mm-hmm. our face, our, mm-hmm. our heart, our silence, our attention. Right. So kind of uh, adding, you know, any of these issues are very complex on their own. Um, of course, the time that we're in now, our, our COVID-19 um, environment that we're in that adds an extra layer of um, complication, complexity. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, the pressure on education within the families kind of related to um, neurodiversity and COVID-19 and those types of things. So back when it all hit, we were at spring break. We never came back from spring break. Mm -hmm. We kind of limped through the summer. Some of us did what we could. And then the schools started getting geared up, and there was a lot of rules they had to conform to for the reimbursement by the state of whatever state they're in. We happen to be in Texas. And then the parents had to process the fear, and then the kids had to process a lot of stuff. So right now we, uh, like, for example, John's on the bus. And he's happy about that. That's a big decision of family by family. Are you going to send the kids or not? Are they going to be at home or not? Where is their station to learn? Are we going to have loggerheads at home? Or can we figure out some way to process the frustration? Because at at a prevention level to to suicide, frustration, right? (laughs) So how do we help people not be frustrated if they're under extra challenges? And so then um, sometimes that's, there's compromises to that. And um, to help the children, so this was something I was taught, and, and I guess we have some cameras here. So um, it goes back to the year two in his age when he was diagnosed, and the OT said, okay, just imagine that this is all of your resources, all of your power, insurance, money, time, attention. And so I turned it into a heart with all of the workshops I do. So they said, just imagine that you're going to do half of every single thing. You're going to spend half of everything that you've got to help that child. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to take the other half of everything that you've got, and you're going to love them just as they are. 
So in all of this, depending on which picture, which box resonates with whomever you're with, there's also that other half of it, which is you're, you're great the way you are. You know, you're not a mistake. God knew you were coming. You're not a mistake. So what can we do to help you at the same time help you find peace within your own heart, given that we all have our difficult challenges? COVID, education, the families at home struggling with the, uh, you know, do I send my kid or not? Do I try to keep up with the interface on the computer? Your turn, sorry. No. Amy's oh, no. looking at her watch. No, no, no. I just want to make no, sure no. that we stay on time. There, I mean, you know, we could probably do even more. Um, so, Dr. Maria, on what this. would you add to that? I didn't mean to hog the ball. No, no, no. COVID's been an interesting boy, talk about an understatement. COVID's been an interesting experience. <laughs> when something like this happens that threatens our health, that, that threatens our finances, I, huge changes, uh, our first reaction is survival. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. The mental health part gets pushed aside because we're just struggling. You know, do we have to wipe our, our groceries when we come home? And did I just breathe on somebody? Did they breathe on me? All those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That has kind of maintained and now revived with kids going back to school and parents concerned and so on. But behind it is this constant threat at some level that, that the majority of people are, are feeling and isolation. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at this particular group of people that we're talking about, our neurodiverse community. They're already kind of isolated anyway. They're not the social butterflies at school. They're not the students that are being sought after to, to be the quarterback of the football team or prom king or queen. They're already isolated. And usually the kinds of activities that they seek out socially are going to school. <laughs> being able to have that structure. So they didn't go back from spring break. I have clients that the parents say it's, it's just been a nightmare because still months later, he's asking me, when am I going back to school? Mm -hmm. And going back to school is not the experience that they were used to doing. So this sense of isolation, this sense of loneliness is highly correlated with consequent depression. And depression is, in, is correlated with higher suicide risk. Mm. So we've been talking about what do we do? What could we as the behavioral health support, uh, uh, um, suicide prevention group, do to support folks that have these special needs? Uh, and and I, I've been looking at ways of combating loneliness. Mm. Could we leverage some of the resources that we have now particularly those online resources, to start bringing people together and creating that community, those connections that help people feel less lonely, including the families, by the way, especially sure. those families that their supports have been gone. You know, you get that little respite when your kid's at school, and that's not happening now. And on top of that, you're going to have to become the teacher, the special <laughs> ed teacher. Yeah. That's a tough one. Um, it, just to coincidentally, Tri-County has actually set up a COVID-19 support uh, where folks can call in. You don't have to be a Tri-County client okay. to access this, uh, to help families get resources and find supports, um, look for residential supports, financial supports, whatever they may be eligible for. Uh, so folks can certainly call Tri-County to get some of that um, information about things that might be out in the community. Um, but ultimately, I think loneliness is one of our biggest battles. So let's share how to get in contact with Tri-County to get uh, more information about um, any of the topics sure. that we've talked about. But um, you, you mentioned the COVID outreach program in particular. Yes, that was yeah. a brand new one um, that uh, we've actually been able to, to develop with some COVID uh, funding and it is, I have to look at it because it's got its own number and I, I'll, I will give the number, but I can also tell folks at any point in time, you can just call the main number at Tri-County and they'll funnel you to the right place because we've got a number for just about everything. <laughs> we so, do too, yeah. <laughs> uh, the main number at Tri-County is 936-521-6100. The number for the outreach program specifically, if you want to call directly, is 
331. And again, it serves Montgomery, Walker, and Liberty County. Um, and, and I've got a little flyer that they gave me, and I thought, wow, I've got a flyer. This is fantastic. <laughs> Social service referrals, even charitable donations, um, transportation referrals, job assistance, uh, pretty much at, at all inclusive types of supports for people that are struggling under COVID, and I don't know too many people that aren't right now. Right. So. And there's um, online resources as well. I mean, you know, if nothing else, you can right. you can Google uh, Tri County Services. Absolutely. Uh, it, there's well, what is, is Tri County Mental Health Services? Tri right? County Behavioral uh, Health. Behavioral Tri County yep. Behavioral. And be real careful because when you Google Tri County, you get something out in Montgomery, Virginia. <laughs> yeah. So we don't want the Virginia one. We want our Tri County Behavioral Health. <laughs> and then GettingSorted.com also has a lot of resources on that as well. Yes, we are, uh, it's, it's a great age to have um, some of these, I mean, COVID outstanding, but a great time in history to have uh, some of these challenges because of the tools. So um, Zoom has actually turned out to be a real blessing for a lot of the, the collaborations that we're doing our, from our first responder supports when dealing with neurodiversity, which is kind of a cousin to what we're doing at BHSP here. Um, and then all of our other collaborations, uh, Gamer at so some new ones, right, that have popped up. Gamer Attitude is one, um, the sciences of um, the brain, education, and neurodiversity. We were talking about what our next iteration, our next project is going to be, which is getting ready for the holiday blues and doing some connection, setting up some Zoom groups. Uh, maybe one that uh, does e uh, electronic games, digital games, um, building community. Or uh, we've got a couple of people that really want board games, which is a little bit more of a nuance. One of our interns from Sam Houston State has a Twitch channel, so we're figuring out how we can do you know, like game voiceover. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, that's I don't know if we are getting uh, off your agenda here and how your time is but um, certainly the ability to collaborate and make something happen in this day is so easy yeah. you know multiple websites so our pro our teams run two separate uh, 5013 C's nonprofits one for the siblings one for workplace readiness um, um, just uh, when we see a need, some of us are more constrained by corporateness and some of us are less constrained by that. Mm -hmm. And we can put together some amazing collaborations, um, even with some of our teams. We know folks down in the greater Houston area that are doing similar things. And of course, you have a wealth of information with yeah. all of your contacts, yeah, too. Yeah, sure. And then, so the Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force is also working on putting together a website, Community Help. Dot org. So um, I, I often tripped over that because I always want to say community health because that's what I do, but it's community help, so H-E-L-P. And that's going to be just kind of a, a holding place for all the different work groups and the resources that are available. So that'll be another great resource um, that's available that anybody can uh, access as well. And, and again, another way to kind of figure out, because you guys both mentioned, I think, when you were talking that... Um, it can be really overwhelming. So there's just, you know, particularly when you're in stress and you're in crisis and you've got, you know, as we talked about, complex issues, it can be difficult to find the help that you need. But here in Montgomery County, we have such a wealth of help that's available. So, but just sometimes it's a matter of trying to just, just finding where it's at and, and you have to be persistent and ask and ask again and ask again, because it may not be just handed to you right away, um, whatever it is that you need, but that communityhelp.org will actually be a great uh, resource. And there's also another, we haven't really touched on it much yet, and that is the shame. You know, the shame and the, and the fear, we've mentioned fear, but there's a level of shame, whether you're the parent of or you're the more cognizant, self-aware person uh, that you know you don't keep up with your peers. I'm sure my John, he's rising 14, he knows that he's not keeping up with all of his peers. But if we can help with, and this goes back to the mental health, right? Yes. And the behavioral health too, for the behaviors that come from the mental which is um, that we all, it's okay that we're not perfect. Right, and it's okay to ask for help. And I think, um, so we've done several shows um, on different aspects of the Behavioral Health and Suicide Prevention Task Force, but just kind of in general, good mental health, good, good physical health is, uh, it's okay to ask for help. None of us are perfect. We all need a little bit of help. So asking for it, finding it is a, is a good way to do that. And so 
hopefully listening to this show has been helpful for people who um, are listening. We, you know, we're here every Friday, right? So we do the the extension hour where we talk about our people and our programs and our partnerships. And um, it's been a wonderful partnership with Behavioral Health and Suicide mm-hmm. Prevention. And just, it's so great to have you guys here and those types, to be able to highlight the resources that are here in the community. Um, other cool thing about the extension hour is it's uh, recorded. So it's available on podcast. You can go back and listen. So, you know, a, a couple of weeks from now, someone may go, oh, I missed that show. Um, you know what? You can go back and listen to it online, and um, the, you know you, you can say, "Well, what, what was it that Dr. Maria said?" Or Gail was talking about that thing, and I just like to learn more about mm-hmm. that. So you can go back and listen right. and find more information. A couple last thoughts that you guys want to share before we sign off. Well, it's a beautiful word, neurodiversity, because it means if you're genetic off or or one or two genes off, your life's not over. If you have any kind of a slight difference, it's okay. And so, and that there's hope. So that's what we want you all to walk away with is the great hope that you have because you're still alive and your brain is plastic and you can, um, and when with neurodiversity, no one is, you're not left out because of, I don't know, some other old bad word. Right. And you're important and you matter and we want you here. Yes. Yep. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here. We'll be back next week. I'm Amy Ressler. This is the Extension Hour and we'll see you soon. Today's show was recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and all rights and ownership are reserved to Lone Star Community Radio. For more information regarding this program and Lone Star Community Radio, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station, serving the community with local programming on TV, radio, and online. If you enjoyed today's program, please support us by sponsorship or starting your own show. Contact us today by phone or text at 936-666-1084 or email the station at lscrstudios at gmail.com.